Right, hi. So I gave a keynote earlier. There's like this one fun little thing that I didn't manage to squeeze in because of time constraints. So I'm going to do this as an encore. So recap. Does this work? Now it does. Recap. So I had this little algorithm, how to make stubborn engineers agree on a solution, right? Which consists of state the problem, list the requirements. And then, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that you need to remember when you list the requirements. Um, then you do that, and then you list all the proposed solutions, A, B, and C, for example. Then you make an evolution graph, like for example, A can be evolved into B or C, but B and C kind of, they're not mutually like, compatible. You need to choose between them. And then you construct the table. I don't have a good name for it yet, so I'm just going to call it the table. Um, but um, the things that you do there is you mark each cell as yes, no, or partially. And there's no more complicated things allowed. There's only three options, green, red, yellow, because it's nice and visual. Everybody understands what that means. And so you do that, and then sometimes you end up with, you know, C is all green, great. Sometimes you end up with this situation where, ah, so it turns out we, it is impossible to satisfy requirements three and four simultaneously. So then you have to go and actually agree on, you know, which of these is more important, which for the language, for the community, for everybody. And so um, I actually hit this problem now uh, very concretely with one thing that we really, really, really want to do with C++29, uh, which is pre and post on virtual functions. I should say that, you know, this is good because the only thing you have to argue is this, right? So, so like all the other stuff, you don't have to argue, you just have to figure out this one thing. So, and this is the problem, you know, we don't have that in CSS 26, we didn't solve it in time, we didn't agree on the right solution in time, so that's why if you put pre and post on virtual functions in CSS 26, it's all formed. It's unfortunate, virtual functions are, you know, very common. So you want to make that happen. And so, um, you know, I did this thing with the help of a bunch of people, list all the requirements that anybody ever formulated, list every solution that anybody ever came up with, including going all the way back to 1986 and with Bertrand Meyer and Eiffel, which actually does this. They do have contract assertions on virtual functions. So this is how the decision matrix here looks like. Uh, this is how the table looks like. Um, so this is all very small font. We don't need to go over this now. I hope you can see the red, green, and yellow more or less. So uh, there's this one thing here, which is there's one requirement that only one solution satisfies, and that's the Bertrand Meyer thing, which only the Bertrand Meyer solution does. There's a bunch of other stuff that it doesn't do. So we need to decide whether we really, really care about that. We probably don't. Um, so we just got that, and then we're really talking about the rightmost two here. Um, and then um, there is uh, this one thing here right, where the rightmost two, there's one requirement that one doesn't satisfy, and there's another requirement which another one doesn't satisfy. So we need to figure out which one is more important. And it kind of, in this particular case, boils down to which one is more intuitive. And that is really hard. So we, we had on this slide earlier that, you know, don't include things you cannot measure, but it turns out we can actually measure this. So. Uh, what's the problem here? So let's say you have a base class and there's a precondition on it. And then, you know, we, we construct the object of that base class, we call that function, and then probably we do expect that this precondition assertion fails here if uh, we enable checks, right? Right? So what happens if we derive from this class override f and then we don't put a precondition on the override? And then, you know, we call derived f through a reference to base. That is a fascinating question, different trade-offs, different solutions. We're not going to talk about this. We're going to talk about what happens if we just have a derived. There's no reference to base. There's no pointer to base. We never name base anywhere. We just construct the derived, and then we call the function derived, which doesn't have a, a pre on it, but there is a pre on the base class. So the question is, should this compile? That's the first question. The second question is, should this fail when checks are enabled. What is more intuitive to you? And you guess what's coming now? You can be a part of making C++29 do the right thing. Please think about this for a minute and then go and vote. And um, I think I have 15 seconds left, so I don't think I'll have time to reveal the um, answer, so maybe I'll do that later. But it would really appreciate if you could 
um, vote. I'm really, really curious what people actually expect to happen here because we had very, very bitter debates about this within the set of people who are working on this problem. So I want to get this data point, and it would really, really help us get C29 right. Think about it for a minute. Vote. Come find me later. I'll tell you what the result was. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.